Hi, this is Dr. A. So this video is a request from a student, and we're going to talk a little bit about female reproduction <clears throat> and birth control in this short video. All right, so let's first talk about ovulation. Um, a process called ovulation releases the secondary oocyte, which is the egg, um, what we refer to as egg, which can be fertilized, from the surface of the ovary, and it's surrounded by layers of follicular cells. And um, you can see the you know, primordial follicles developed in utero when a, when a baby girl is inside her mom's uterus. And um, really, uh, you have a bunch of primary follicles. And then at um, puberty, we start maturing these. And um, these follicles mature, such as every 28 days, an egg is going to be released. And the process of releasing that egg or secondary oocyte from uh, the follicle is, is called ovulation. And then what's left behind in the ovary turns into the corpus luteum and then the corpus albicans. And we're gonna talk about the significance of all this. Um, a burst of luteinizing hormone from the anterior pituitary is what triggers this ovulation. And it's luteinizing hormone because this is a corpus luteum and it causes this to become the corpus luteum. And luteum means yellow and it is indeed yellow. Um, and so this little oocyte is uh, going to be released and it's going to start traveling down the fallopian tubes and, and if it's not fertilized shortly after it's released, so really within days, uh, it doesn't live much, um, it's not viable much past that, then uh, it will degenerate and there will not be any possibility of fertilization. So as you see in this diagram of the female anatomy, so you have your vagina, cervix, here's the uterus, the fallopian tubes, and the ovaries right here on both sides. Uh, and so this one is ovulating here and the egg is released and it starts traveling down. Um, if their um, sperm arrives in here at the time, or around the time this has been released, the sperm has to travel all the way up here. And generally fertilization is going to happen in this upper third of the fallopian tube and then um, the fertilized egg at this point in time then is going to continue uh, dividing and traveling and dividing and traveling uh, down and it takes about a week for it from fertilization for it to make its way all the way down the fallopian tube and implant itself here into the uterus. Once it has implanted in the uterus then a woman is considered pregnant and you'll start uh, releasing the pregnancy hormones, HCG, which then can trigger a positive pregnancy test. But it does take a week for this process to happen. And once the egg is released, it has to be fertilized within a few days um, in order for fertilization to occur and for pregnancy to occur. Okay, so let's <clears throat> talk about a uh, a bit about the hormones because the hormones are really going to be the target of the birth control. So understanding how they work in a normal cycle is really important. So um, hormones are secreted by three different glands, hypothalamus, the anterior pituitary, and then ovaries themselves. And all of them control uh, female reproduction and also the development of the secondary sexual characteristics, which for women are the development of the breasts and uh, the rounding of the hips and all the soft curves that women have. So about around 10 years of age, it varies from ch child to child, uh, but the hypothalamus starts beginning to secrete more GnRH. So GnRH stands for gonadotropin releasing hormone. Your gonadotropins are LH and FSH that work on your gonads, and the gonads for the females are the ovaries, and for the males are the testes. Both males and females will produce GnRH, gonadotropin releasing hormone, and uh, cause a release of LH and FSH in both male and females. Just the effect of them on the gonads is different. Um, and so um, LH is luteinizing hormone and FSH is follicle stimulating hormone and these are secreted by the anterior pituitary. Now the anterior pituitary is really close to the hypothalamus so this, there's not a lot to travel but it is kind of a domino effect and, and it controls timing of the cycle. So GnRH causes a release of LH and FSH 
And um, at puberty, then under the, the influence of FSH, the ovaries will start s synthesizing estrogen and estrogens uh, are going to start maturing up the follicles and also giving a uh, female the, the breasts and the hips and uh, all the female characteristics. So um, there are three different types of estrogens. There's estradiol, estrone, and estriol. The one that's responsible uh, for the um, ovulation and, and the, really the female cycle as, as we know it, uh, the main one is estradiol. So the one that is produced um, predominantly by female of reproductive age is estradiol. Uh, there's also estrone and estriol. And um, I always get them confused, I believe estriol. One of them is, is only produced during pregnancy, I believe it's estriol. And another one is, hangs around even after menopause, I believe that's estrone. Um, and um, so these, the production of estrogen gives the female their secondary sexual characteristics, as I've already described. So breast development, increased adipose tissue deposition, so fat uh, deposition in certain areas, which then gives um, the women's body a softer, curvier look. And then an increased vascularization of the skin, which give women pretty skin. Uh, ovaries also will secrete progesterone. And progesterone triggers uterine changes during the menstrual cycle. Um, I like to think of progesterone, the, it's really kind of the, the hormone that helps facilitate pregnancy. And you'll see why when we look at how these all cycle together. So estrogen and progesterone are the two main hormones that are produced by females, but they also will produce some of the androgens. So androgens are really the male hormones. So this are like testosterone and DHEA. And we produce a little bit of it. And uh, these androgens um, are responsible for getting the pubic and axillary hair. So this is underarm hair. And um, the fact that we have low levels of androgens will allow our hips to broaden so we can carry children. And, and the level of androgen or testosterone can also affect libido. So basically you have to have enough of them around to have good sex drive. Um, and so males, um, I actually do have some estrogen on board also, but they have a lot more of the androgens of the testosterone. A little bit on estrogen dominance, uh, this is a side note, um, female hormones. It's, uh, females often have hormone imbalances. Um, and so estrogen dominance is quite common in our society now. And it's, uh, when you talk about estrogen dominance, what it means is you have too much estrogen in relationship to the amount of progesterone that's present. Symptoms of estrogen dominance are going to be decreased sex drive, irregular or otherwise abnormal menstrual periods, bloating, which is water retention, breast swelling and tenderness, fibrocystic breast, headaches, especially premenstrual headaches, mood swings. Most often it's irritability and depression, weight and or fat gain, particularly around the abdomen and hips, cold hands and feet, which is a symptom of thyroid dysfunction, hair loss, which is also a symptom of thyroid dysfunction, of course, thyroid dysfunction, sluggish metabolism, which is also a signal of um, thyroid dysfunction, foggy thinking, memory loss, fatigue, trouble sleeping, insomnia, and PMS. So that's a long list of symptoms. Um, and what causes estrogen dominance, dominance in our society is really endocrine disruptors and xenoestrogens. So these are chemical molecules that have been added into our products, personal care products, cleaning products, plasticizers, and all that. BPA, for example, is a quite a common one that found a lot of plastic bottles and it mimics estrogen so it's floating around in the body and is acting like estrogen but it's it's not really estrogen it's a plasticizer it's bpa but it can fit in estrogen receptors and so it has the same effects as estrogen and your body reads it as estrogen and um so this is definitely a problem and can cause problem also you know with uh, fertility and um, i mean look at the list of, of problems uh, menarche is uh, the scientific term for your period for those monthly changes in the uterine lining that lead to the menstrual flow, which is period, as uh, the endometrium is shed. Um, so basically every month you build up your endometrium to maintain pregnancy and pregnancy doesn't happen. It's shed and it's built back up and then it's shed and it's built back up. So uh, a menstrual cycle is started by FSH, follicle-stimulating hormone. This is the first to rise. 
Um, and that stimulates the maturation of the follicle in the ovary so that you can have ovulation. The follicular cells that surround the developing oocyte then secrete estrogen. So estrogen is going to be higher in that first part of the menstrual cycle, uh, which it helps maintain those sec secondary sexual characteristics as well as uh, starts thickening that uterine lining. Uh, so it has multiple roles. Um, ovulation is then triggered by a mid-cycle surge in luteinizing hormone. So there's a peak of luteinizing hormone that causes that egg to release from the follicle. And then uh, following the ovulation, the follicular cells turn into the corpus luteum. And the corpus luteum starts increasing, uh, secreting increasing amounts of estrogen and progesterone. Uh, and it, it actually increases more progesterone. It secretes more progesterone than estrogen. At this point in time, and, and this is because progesterone can help maintain that early pregnancy. And so we've just released the egg. There's that potential for fertilization. So we want progesterone to maintain that uterine lining so pregnancy can happen. But if pregnancy does not occur, there's no fertilization of the egg. Then that corpus luteum then degenerates and uh, the hormone levels of estrogen and progesterone start declining and the uterine lining disintegrates in the shed and that's when you have your period. When your hormone levels decline, a lot of times it gives you that PMS, the, the, you know, the moodiness and the symptoms that you have right before your period start is from, is from the estrogen and progesterone going down. Having a good amount of estrogen in your body, not too much, it actually gives you, makes you feel good and gives you good energy. And um, <clears throat> the remnant uh, of what used to be the corpus luteum now is called the corpus albicans, and it's just inactive. And during the cycle, then, estrogen and progesterone will inhibit that, uh, the increased release of LH and FSH, and then when estrogen and progesterone levels fall, then FSH and LH can increase again, and therefore they start the whole cycle again and mature the next follicle and start the next cycle. So in a, um, this is a good diagram that I really like because it, it, it gives you a visual about everything that's going on. So let's start here at the bottom. Your, um, the day, day one of your cycle is when you start bleeding. So we've picked that because everybody can identify that day. So start bleeding, start shedding that lining is day one. So your estrogen and progesterone levels uh, are at the lowest there. Your, your bleeding, shedding, um, and the fact that they're at the lowest, it allows your LH and FSH to start rising. So as LH and FSH start rising, FSH especially will stimulate the development of the follicle, uh, and it will stimulate increased amounts of estrogen. Okay, Estrogen will start peaking right before ovulation. You're going to feel really good, high energy. And then the LH... Uh, spike is what causes this uh, ovulation release of the ovary. This is typically around day 14, and this is counted obviously with day one being the first day of your period. Now, honestly, if you are not using an app to track your period, you really, really should. And um, that can help you predict when ovulation happens. And um, then if you're trying to get pregnant, that's when you want to have sex is around the time of ovulation. If you're not trying to get pregnant, then or you're trying to not get pregnant, then you want to definitely avoid anything around this time because this is a high risk time for you getting pregnant. All right. So um, after ovulation, estrogen levels decline and then build back up as corpus luteum starts making some. Uh, and then your progesterone, which in the first half is lower than estrogen, and the second half is going to be higher than estrogen. And so the, this, is, this, this rising of the progesterone and, you know, the estrogen helps too here, builds up this uterine lining to welcome a fertilized egg. And when um, it doesn't happen, then the everything, the, the progesterone and estrogen levels drop, and that causes the shedding of this lining. You bleed, clear it out, and then start over. Now, um, what's happening here is, again, you need a progesterone to maintain this uterine lining at the, for the early pregnancy, to ma maintain an early uh, pregnancy for the egg to implant. And so it's it's keeping it up here, and it's basically looking for days, like almost like a week plus, it's looking for 
uh, this this fertilized egg that's supposed to be arriving and it's just kind of hanging out there looking 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 and when it finally it's like okay it's just not going to be there then everything drops in levels and that causes just shedding and um, we'll get to this in a second but basically hormonal birth control mimics this phase and you basically are staying in this phase right here the entire month <clears throat> so it is worth um, mentioning menopause here. So when um, your menstrual cycle stop, then you enter menopause. Um, and this is where you're no longer ovulating and no longer having a period. Um, and because you're no longer ovulating, having a, a period, then uh, your estrogen levels will start to decline. Some women will see their breasts shrink and have the effects, see the effects of not having enough, you know, the estrogen around anymore. So now let's get into birth control. Birth control refers to the voluntary regulation of the number of offsprings produced, so allowing you to choose how many kids you can have um, and when you can have them too. And um, so that requires the use of contraception. And contraception or birth control fall into two big categories. Um, one, to avoid fertilization and two, to prevent implantation. Okay. So things that avoid fertilization keep sperm and egg from meeting. And so these are things like condoms, male and female condoms, uh, diaphragms, uh, cervical caps. Uh, so they're physical barriers that keep them from meeting. Some of the uh, implantable devices can also do that um, by, you know, block it. Sorry about that. Um, blocking um, the the pathways that they go inside your uterus and this blocks the fallopian tube, this blocks the fallopian tube, and this is in the uterus. Um, and others work on um, preventing implantation and some on uh, blocking ovulation, and those are going to be all the hormonal-based ones. These are spermicides, so really they kind of avoid fertilization, but they're trying to kill the sperm uh, before um, the you know obviously before it's fertilizes the egg um and so on on this um another question that uh, was asked is about you know abortion in different birth control methods in the morning after pill and stuff and so generally speaking um most people don't have any issues with using things that avoid fertilization um, you'll start seeing ethical issues and disagreement on on methods that prevent implantation because uh, it all depends on what you hold as when life begins. So if you hold that life begins at conception, so when sperm meets egg, uh, that which happens in a fallopian tube before implantation, if you're doing anything to block that implantation, then you are essentially causing an abortion in a way. So that can this is where sometimes there's some ethical um you know, disagreements basically between different belief systems. So let's go into all the different methods of contraception. So coitus interruptus um, is the pull-out method, basically uh, for the male trying to not ejaculate into the female. So uh, then therefore there are no sperm entering into the female, therefore, you know, supposedly no baby is made. Uh, so not a foolproof method, obviously, plus you don't have the protection against STDs. The rhythm method is on a female end. So this is where um, app using apps that track your periods can be very helpful. But um, you you lo look at where you know when when you which cycle part of the cycle you're in, and if you in that week around ovulation, then if you want to get pregnant, that's when you have sex, and if you don't want to get pregnant, that's when you absolutely do not have sex. And Basically, the way the the women use a rhythm method is they abstain from sex in, or in, around ovulation and then have it the other three weeks of their period. Of, I'm sorry, three three weeks, yeah, of their cycle, not really of their period of their cycle. And um, so, yeah, that that can work pretty well. Uh, this works really if you have a very predictable period. If you don't have a very predictable period, this can be really hard to to manage. Um, Mechanical barriers, um, male or female condoms, diaphragms, cervical caps, all physical barriers that keep sperm and egg from meeting. Obviously, the problems there, um, 
the male or female condoms at least can prevent sexually transmitted infections and such. Um, the problem would be if they rip uh, or if they tear or, or somebody poke holes in your diaphragm or cervical cap. Um, then you have your chemical barriers, so the cream, foam, and jellies that are spermicides that just are meant to be inserted in there and kill sperm. And then we get into all the combined the hormonal contraceptives. Um, and so whether it's uh, an oral pill, um, so a chemical ring, a patch, there's also some injectable contraception and contraceptive implants. All of those have a hormonal component to them. And then in the intrauterine devices, uh, there's that's the little T one. Um, some of them have some a hormone base to them, and some of them don't, like the copper ones do not. And then lastly, you have surgical methods. Those are the permanent ones, so they're sterilization, meaning you cannot have kids after that anymore. Uh, and they're harder to, to, much harder to reverse. And that would be vasectomy and tubal ligation, where in a vasectomy, you, you, um, cutting the vas deferens and tying both vas deferens up so that the sperm um, stays inside the testicles and it never leaves the testicles. Now the male still makes semen, but there's no sperm in the semen. Okay, so they can still have sex and everything. They're just not making babies in a kind of fun way to say it. They're like shooting blanks, right? And uh, tubal ligation is for the female, and you tie, you cut and tie up the over, ovarian tubes, the, the fallopian tubes here, where uh, the when the egg is released every month, it can't travel down the tube, and it's just released into the abdomen, and it can't be fertilized. So let's talk a little bit about hormonal birth control. Um, so as we view with the female cycle, this is how uh, your your estrogen peaks before ovulation and then kind of drops, and then your your progesterone, which is lower, peaks here. So um, this is a high estrogen phase. This is a high progesterone phase. The high progesterone phase is when it's after ovulation, and it's when you're looking to see if you're pregnant. Well, the birth control basically mimic this, and you just have all month long high progesterone, low estrogen, and then you have its period of time. Although, really, because you did not have that estrogen peak, um, you you don't really complete like build your estrogen, your uh, endocrine, sorry, your uterine lining the way you do here in a normal monthly cycle. Uh, but there's still a little bit, and you you get it's not a true period. It's really what they call breakthrough bleeding. Uh, and um, you can even have some, if you're constantly, if you constantly take the pill and don't take this week off, then you, you can go without having any bleeding. Um, they actually, when they first released the birth control pill, they tried that, but it was freaking women out to not have that bleed, breakthrough bleeding or that bleeding every month. And so they, that's why they built in that one week of like sugar pills so that there's the breakthrough bleeding, so that which kind of mimics a period, and then women felt more comfortable with that. So, um, so hormonal contraceptives usually contain alternate forms of estrogen and or a synthetic form of progesterone that's called progestin. There are several types of progestin. I think there's up to seven different ones, which um, can affect women differently, and that's how some women may tolerate certain forms of birth control better than others. Um, these stop the normal hormonal pattern and thus can stop ovulation and or can stop um, implantation. Uh, the hormonal contraceptives that uh, include both estrogen and progestin are your combined oral contraceptives, so your pills, the hormonal vaginal ring, and the contraceptive patches. And the hormonal contraceptives that have only progestin are progestin-only pills, also called the mini pills. Um, contraceptive shot or injections, uh, typically under the name Depo-Provera. Implantable contra contraceptive rods, usually put into your arm, they're the implants. And uh, intrauterine devices uh, with levonorgestrel. So a little bit on this. Um, this book is really cool uh, by Sarah Hill. This is your brain on birth control. Um, if you really want to see how it affects you, this is an excellent book because um, whether you're on birth control or you're cycling normally will affect um, the way you think. It will affect who you're attracted to. 
uh, the type of man that you're attracted to, you know, the type of man you're willing to, you know, settle down with uh, and have relationships with. And, and it's really interesting because if you are on the pill when you meet, but then go off the pill later, <clears throat> you can actually change your perception of the person and it can, can make you wonder like why you were attracted to them in the first place. Or if you were off the pill and then go on the pill, it can also change that. Anyway, so I highly recommend this. If you really want to kind of dig deep into it, this is an excellent book. <clears throat> so now let's talk a little bit about the morning after pill which is uh, emergency co contraception, um, plan B, or the morning after pill. And this is sold over the counter in pharmacies. You do not have to have a prescription. And um, it basically affects your levels of estrogen and progesterone, uh, usually by increasing them, or uh, some of them can work by interfering with proteins that can interact with the hormones. Um, so it, mess it messes with your hormones. And so... Their primary way of working, and they're still really not 100% sure about what exactly it does, but it's the idea is that it would block ovulation. So it's giving you the signal that we're looking for pregnancy actually before ovulation happens. Uh, but if you waited too long to take it and you didn't take it the morning after and um, the fertilization occurred because you had ovulated, it won't uh, end the pregnancy. It was not guaranteed to end the pregnancy. Uh, so if the egg gets to implant, the fertilized egg gets to implant, then um, it, you know, it's not going to, it's not going to do anything. But um, if, if you take it in that window and the fertilization has occurred, it can also mess with the fertilized egg implanting into the uterus. But if you take it after the egg has naturally implanted, the fertilized egg has naturally implanted in the uterine lining, then it won't end the pregnancy. So it's not recommended for use as a primary uh, method of birth control, but it is recommended in circumstances maybe where, you know, the condom broke or, um, you know, the contraception was used improperly or no contraception at all was used. Um, and so it, but it is important uh, if that, if that's going to be uh, an, an option, it has to occur really as soon as possible, ideally the morning after uh, and to not wait because the longer um, a female waits, then the more likely it is that, um, you know, the fertilization will happen and implantation will happen also. Although it, it, as discussed earlier, it does take quite uh, it, from really from fertilization, it takes a week for that fertilized egg to travel down into implant in the uterine lining, because it messes with implantation of the uh, egg. So it, it, you know, it, it messes if you take it right, right at the right time. It'll mess with the fertilized egg implanting into the uterine lining if you take it early enough. Um, some, you know, believe if you believe that um, life begins at conception when sperm meets egg, then this is a form of early abortion. And so some people are against doing the morning after pill because it prevents implantation of a fertilized egg. So, um, again, the what's in the morning after pill is very similar to what is in birth control. It is usually, again, a progesterone in the form of levonorgestrel, but it's a high level of it which is usually more effective, or it can be an estrogen progesterone combo. Uh, sometimes these do not work well in obese women because we tend to absorb out um, estrogen progesterone into our fat cells. Um, also worth um, mentioning, you can do a copper IUD for emergency contraception, um, and it's an intrauterine device can be used. It can also be used for, for that, and uh, it's inserted into the uterus by a healthcare provider. Therefore, it's, it's, very, it's really effective, but it requires an office visit and uh, the cost of putting it in. Um, and that's usually a higher cost in um, the, um, you know, the morning after pill. But you, once it's in, you can keep it as an ongoing method of birth control. And then the last one is the abortion pill or LL1. Um, so it works by preventing the hormone progesterone from having its effect. So it's, it blocks the effect of progesterone. Um, uh, on ovulation inside the uterus. So remember I said progesterone is important to maintain that early pregnancy. And so it's going to block progesterone so that it cannot maintain that early pregnancy. 
And so it's going to block with that implantation again of the fertilized egg <clears throat> into the uterine lining, but it's not a hormone. It's a, chemi a chemical. It's called ulipristol acetate. But this one is only available by prescription. So uh, it's not an over-the-counter one. So there you go. That um, is your summary on everything. Here are some other sources that I use. Uh, if you have any questions, you can just drop them in the comments. And if I can, I will help you and answer them. Thank you.